My gosh, so what ha you got whacked in the head during a bar fight? That is terrible, bud. You have just got to learn how to handle your liquor a little bit better. Hi, I'm Joe Alton, MD, also known as Dr. Bones of doomandbloom.net, and I'm the co-author, along with my lovely wife, Nurse Amy, of the Survival Medicine Handbook, a book that assumes that modern medicine is no longer available and that you may be the end of the line with regards to your family's well-being in a survival scenario. Today we're going to talk about head injuries with my friend T.D. Bird, famous throughout the internet, and this guy. Head injuries is a topic and head injuries can be soft tissue injuries to the scalp, blood vessels, or the brain itself, or bony injuries to the skull or facial bones. Damage is usually caused by some type of direct impact such as a cut in the the scalp area in the skin or a fracture on the part of the, of the part of the skull that actually contains the brain, also called the cranium. An open head injury means that the skull has been penetrated with possible exposure of brain tissue, if this guy had brains. If you can imagine how serious this wound could be, you would have a good idea of what's going to happen in a survival scenario. If the skull is not fractured, thank goodness, which is most of the time, it's referred to as a closed injury. Damage can also be caused by the rebound of the brain inside the walls of the skull. This can cause tearing of blood vessels in the brain, which can result in hemorrhage which is very, very dangerous. There may be no obvious penetrating wound in a case like this. The original trauma may have even occurred on the other side of the head or even at a site other than a head. An example of this would be the violent shaking of an infant, which oftentimes causes this kind of damage. Anyone with a traumatic injury to head must always be observed closely, as symptoms from bleeding and swelling may take time to develop. The brain requires blood and oxygen to function normally. An injury which causes bleeding or swelling inside the skull will increase the pressure, the intracranial pressure. This causes the heart to work harder to get blood and oxygen into the brain. Blood accumulation, also known as a hematoma, could occur within the brain tissue itself or from between the layers of tissue that cover the brain, dura or epidura. Now, without adequate circulation, brain function ceases. Pressure that's high enough to actually cause a portion of the brain to push downward through the base of the skull is known as a brain herniation. Without modern medical care, this will almost certainly lead to death because it is treated with intravenous steroids and not always successfully. Luckily, most head injuries result only in a cut to the scalp and a swelling at the site of impact. Cuts on the scalp or the face will tend to bleed. They'll look scarier than they really are because there are many small blood vessels that travel through this area. This bleeding, although significant, does not have to signify internal damage. Most cases actually can be treated as with any other laceration. There are a number of signs and symptoms, however, which identify those patients that are more seriously affected. This is important to know. They include loss of consciousness, convulsions, uh, seizures, worsening headache over time, nausea and vomiting, bruising around the eyes or the ears, or bleeding from the ears and the nose, and confusion or drowsiness. So you'll sometimes see one pupil more dilated than the other, and of course any indentation of the skull tells you that you have somebody with a head injury. A person with trauma to the head could be knocked unconscious for a period of time, or they could remain completely alert. If consciousness is not lost, the patient may experience a headache and could require treatment for superficial injuries. After a period of observation, a head injury without loss of consciousness is most likely not serious unless one of the other signs and symptoms from the list that I just mentioned are noted. Now, loss of consciousness for a brief time, say two minutes or so, will merit close observation for the next 48 hours. This patient will usually awaken somewhat foggy. We call these types of head injuries, by the way, concussions. So your patient may be foggy, may be unclear as to how the injury occurred or the events that happened shortly before the injury. It will be important to be certain that the patient has regained normal motor function. In other words, make sure they can move all their extremities with normal range and strength. Even so, you have to have rest prescribed for this patient for the remainder of the day so they can be closely watched.
It's okay to let your patient get some sleep. Once asleep, it might be appropriate to awaken them or see if they're rousable every three hours to make sure that they have not developed any of the danger signals that we mentioned before in, in this video. This is somewhat controversial, I have to say. I've read a number of articles that suggest waking a patient only in worrisome cases. What are worrisome cases? Anybody with a concussion to me is worrisome. In most cases, a concussion though causes no permanent damage unless there are multiple episodes of head trauma over time, as in the case of boxers or some other athletes. Now, if the period of unconsciousness is over 10 minutes in length, you have to suspect the possibility of some type of significant injury. Vital signs such as pulse, respiration, and blood pressure have to be monitored closely. You make sure you use your medical supplies and your blood pressure cuff. Uh, to keep an eye on, on your patient. The patient's head should be immobilized and attention should be given to the neck and spine in case that they're already also damaged. Verify that the airway is clear and remove any possible obstructions. In a true survival setting, this person is in a life-threatening situation that will have few curative options if consciousness is not regained. Other signs of a significant injury to this area are the appearance of bruising behind the ears or around the eyes, the raccoon sign, because they look, well, they look like a raccoon, despite the impact not occurring in the areas that are bruised. This could indicate some kind of fracture has occurred with internal bleeding. Bleeding from the ear itself or nose without direct trauma to those areas is another indication. The fluid coming also could be clear and not bloody, this may represent leakage of spinal fluid. Now, in addition, intracranial bleeding may cause pressure that compresses nerves that lead to the pupils. In this case, you'll notice your unconscious patient has one pupil more dilated than the other. A stroke, also known as a cerebrovascular accident or a CVA, occurs when a blood clot blocks an artery or a blood vessel breaks, interrupting blood flow to an area of the brain. When any of these things happen, brain cells begin to die and brain damage occurs. Now, whatever functions are associated with the part of the brain affected may be lost or impaired. This might include the inability to speak, blindness, or loss of normal comprehension when you're trying to speak to your patient. Symptoms such as paralysis or weakness are often on one side of the body or the face. The first symptom of stroke is usually heralded by a sudden severe headache. Strokes may also occur due to other, other reasons as well, such as uncontrolled high blood pressure. Although it may not be difficult to diagnose a major stroke in an austere setting, few options will exist for treating it. Blood thinners might help a stroke caused by a clot, but they'll worsen a stroke caused by, caused by a hemorrhage. It could be difficult to tell which is which without advanced testing. Keep your patient on bed rest. Sometimes they may recover partial function after a period of time. If they do, most improvement will occur in the very first few days. Trauma to the head may have negligible consequences or it could have life-threatening consequences. In some circumstances, there may be little that you, the medic, can do in a long-term survival situation. This is one of those hard realities that our people that will be medically responsible may encounter in times of trouble. This is Joe Alton, MD, that old Dr. Bones, wishing you good health and good times or bad. Thanks so much. Hey, say goodbye. Say goodbye.